What have they done? Hello everyone and welcome. We are sitting inside of the all new BMW M2 and we're gonna keep this simple and entertaining, at least the first part. So we're going to look at six different elements of this car and just say whether or not they are exciting, yes or no. So we will start off with the engine. And yes, uh, as you might imagine, this is an exciting engine. This is the same engine out of the BMW M3 and BMW M4, the S58. It is a three liter inline six cylinder making 453 horsepower and 406 pound feet of torque. This engine is twin turbocharged, so you have one turbo for the first three cylinders, cylinders one through three, and then cylinders four through six go to another turbo. These are mono scroll turbos, not twin scroll turbos like you might see in some of the V8s that BMW uses. Why might that be? Well, first of all, you have an odd number of cylinders going to each turbo, that's part of it. The other part being with three cylinders going to each turbo, you don't have exhaust valve overlap, so you don't need to worry about that scavenging effect, which is what twin scroll turbos take advantage of. So mono scroll turbos work out just fine. This is a potent engine. There is plenty of power here. And just to kind of get an idea, we're gonna go down to third gear, slow down. We are on a bit of a downhill slope, so that's gonna help us. But put my foot down, and you really start to feel the torque at about 3,000 RPM. And this does in fact hit peak torque before 3,000 RPM, and it holds on to that torque for a good long time. So as long as you're above 3,000, uh, the torque, full torque is available. That said, there definitely is turbo lag. So if I put it down in fourth right now, we're at 4,000 RPM, punch it. It's a good second that you're waiting where you don't really feel much and then you feel those turbos spool up and then you start to get good acceleration. Same is true for lower gears. I mean, the thing is, if you're actually, you know, constantly on the power, you're not gonna know it as you shift through the gears and you have that turbo lag, it's very, you know, imperceptible. But if you're just going from nothing to flat, honestly, it may be even longer than a second. There's a decent amount of turbo lag with the engine, but it's got a large torque band. It's got plenty of power. It's an inline six, so it's super smooth. Uh, I do like the engine in this car. Moving on to number two is the transmission, and this is also exciting. So first of all, BMW keeps the manual transmission alive. Thank you, BMW, because not many companies are doing it these days. So the six-speed manual is still an option. It is the exact same six-speed from the previous M2, same gearing. I will always argue that the gearing uh, in pretty much every manual transmission, except maybe like the Miata and BRZ, uh, is too tall. So, you know, the thing is, you get well over 100 miles per hour in the manual in third gear. So from an acceleration standpoint on the road, you never really need anything beyond third gear. That's kind of disappointing because if you've got a manual, you probably want to shift a little bit. I think the realistic solution to that is offering two different gear sets for a manual. You know, one being, hey, am I mostly going to use this car on the road? And then if that's the case, then you get the manual with more aggressive gearing. Are you mostly going to be using the M2 on the track? Then you get the taller gearing where it makes sense and you reach those higher speeds. Of course, we don't have that luxury because the manuals are just kind of dying off. And so I don't think we're going to get options, but were I to have it my way, I would have more aggressive gearing with the manual. Now we are sitting inside of the automatic. This is an eight speed ZF automatic instead of what was used previously, a seven speed dual clutch. You may think that's a downgrade. I do not. Two reasons. First of all, the eight speed's great. It shifts quick. Um, you know, you're not gonna notice any huge differences. Maybe the DCT was slightly quicker, but honestly, this thing shifts fast, it's smooth, it's a great transmission. The other benefit is, since you have one more gear, with that additional gear, it allows you to make the other gears more aggressive. So first gear is about the same as the previous gen automatic, but second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, these are all more aggressive than the dual clutch transmission of the previous M2, which means real world, you have better acceleration in all of these gears. You have better wheel torque, meaning the force that you know pushes you into the seat is greater. So I like this transmission. Uh, I would take it over the seven speed dual clutch. I think it's fantastic. It is aggressive, you know, second gear, you're not even hitting 60 miles per hour. It's like peaking in the fifties. It's real fun, aggressive gearing. You get that little wheel chirp between, you know, the different gears and you can get a little wheel spin in second if it's raining. Number three, let's talk about the looks. I know this is a very polarizing car. 
I'm going to say it's exciting, uh, and I'll give you a reason why, but I looked up the definition of excitement, and it says, causes great enthusiasm. And I think, you know, unequivocally, this, when people look at this, uh, there is an enthusiasm there. Now, enthusiasm generally has a positive connotation, not negative, but there is great enthusiasm surrounding how this looks. People like to talk about it, and so because of that, I will say exciting. Personally, I think it looks all right. We are living in a sea of boring cars out there today, uh, and BMW made something polarizing that people say, oh, I love it, oh, I hate it, I can't stand it, it's hideous. Do I think the older M2 is much better looking? Yes, yes I do. But I like that this is something different, and it gets people thinking about it, and it's not just this same boring soap bar driving through town. So it's at least exciting in that it's very different, and the color is awesome. I love this Zandvoort blue. And so I have a little bit of a conspiracy theory here. Uh, none of this came from BMW. This is all from my own brain, which is unhealthy. And so what I think happened, so Al Bierman used to be head of engineering at BMW M. He is responsible for some of the greatest M cars. Al Bierman was poached by Hyundai, or maybe he went on his own accord. Whatever happened, he switched to Hyundai and helped develop their N line and worked on the Veloster N. So the Veloster N came in performance blue, which to me looks identical to this Zandvoort blue. And then he retired uh, from Hyundai you know, around 2021. So in my head, this color is a nod to Al Bierman and his retirement and you know, just live a nice life doing whatever it is you please. You made some fantastic cars along the way. Uh, so that's what I'm choosing to believe this color is. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic color. Number four is the price. And I think the price is exciting despite, you know, all cars today are insanely expensive. This is starting at about $63,000. But when you start to look at that number, you know, it actually does make a good bit of sense. The 2016 BMW M2, when it came out, was $53,000. Adjusted for inflation, this is cheaper than that BMW M2 in 2016, even though it's starting at $63,000. So cheaper overall, adjusted for inflation, and back in 2016, the BMW M2 was a heck of a car for its price point. It was wildly competitive with the segment that it fell in. So I think the pricing on this is actually really good. And in addition to that, it can't get optioned to insane numbers. The car I'm sitting in right now has a healthy list of options and it's under 70K with destination. If you max out a 2024 BMW M2, you're still under 80K with every box checked. And so that's including a 10,000 carbon fiber package that you really don't need and doesn't provide that much of a benefit. So realistically, pricing on this is quite good. And one final comparison, if you look at this versus the base Porsche Cayman, Porsche 718, the bottom of the barrel Cayman starts at 70K. This is starting $7,000 less than that, significantly more powerful, a little bit quicker. And that Porsche Cayman, you can option past 100K with, you know, you start checking boxes on Porsche, you're over 100K. And that's crazy, right? You're still in a base Cayman. So the pricing for this, including options, is actually pretty decent. And when you start looking at what it competes again, I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, what's the difference between this and the base Cayman? Well, the base Cayman weighs 800 pounds less. I am not lying to you. I don't know how. 800 pounds less than this car right here. That is absurd, which leads us to point number five, the weight, and it is most definitely not exciting. This car is over 3,800 pounds. It weighs the same as the BMW M4. I don't really understand why that happens, right? The BMW M2 used to be the smaller, lighter, more nimble, you know, brother of that BMW M4, and now they weigh the same. So that is crazy to me. If you look at the 2016 BMW M2, this weighs 500 pounds more, and it only has 90 more horsepower. Now that leads you to the question, is 90 horsepower worth 500 pounds? My answer to that question is no. From an acceleration standpoint, the answer is yes. That is a worthwhile trade if your goal is to accelerate faster. 90 horsepower at 500 pounds will make this car quicker, but it makes all the other aspects worse, right? So handling, braking, 
uh, enjoyment to drive, these are all pulled back because you've added so much weight. And I think that is a real question worth asking when you start thinking about this car. Is 90 horsepower worth 500 pounds to you? Another interesting comparison here, if you look at the previous generation M240i xDrive. So it's a two series, it's got the inline six cylinder, and it has all wheel drive. It was 150 pounds lighter than this car here. It's like, what? How is an all wheel drive six cylinder lighter by 150 pounds? I really don't know where the weight comes from in this car. I don't understand why it is so heavy. Now that leads us to number six, the driving experience. And by no stretch of the imagination does this offer a bad driving experience. This is a great car. It's a great car in the exact same way that the BMW M4 is a great car. It's mature, it does everything well, and it just does it. You know, it handles well, it accelerates well, it does all the things you ask of it, and it does it properly and in a mature fashion. If the BMW M4 is your cool dad, well, what used to be the case is that the BMW M2 was your cool dad's wild brother. You know, it was your exciting uncle. But now the BMW M2 is your cool dad's twin brother. This is a BMW M4, both figuratively and literally. It has the exact same engine. It has the exact same transmission. It has the same track width. It has the same wheel and tire sizes. It is a BMW M4. That is what it is. They even weigh the same. And so it used to be the case where the M2, you know, it had this real differentiation from the M4 and that it was lighter and it was a bit more playful and a bit more wild. What's the difference now? I mean, the BMW M4 has a 4.4 inch longer wheelbase. That's about it. Slightly more room in the back seats, a slightly larger trunk, a slightly larger fuel tank. And I do mean slightly for all of those. Realistically, they are the same car. So that to me is what's sad because the BMW M2 is gone. We don't have it anymore. We have something that looks different from an M4, but it is an M4. So if they're both essentially the same, I mean, yeah, the M4 has 20 additional horsepower, but they have very similar acceleration. You know, which one do you choose? And I think the only real way to answer this question, well, if you go back to the pricing discussion we were having, where I was saying this is a good deal, it really looks like a good deal when you compare it to the M4, because it's basically the same, and yet it starts $15,000 less. So that makes a lot of sense. If you want an M4 with all wheel drive, well, the only way to do it is with the M4. They don't offer all wheel drive with the M2. Also, if you want the competition package to get slightly more power, then yeah, the M4 competition is your choice. But realistically, this and the base M4 are the same car. This is $15,000 cheaper. That's my answer. Like, why spend 15 grand unless you just like the difference in how they look and you want the one that looks, you know, different. So all of that sounds like a little disappointing and it's crazy because it's like, this is a great car. This is a really good car. Uh, it's mature, it's stable, it does everything well. It's not really an M2 anymore. And so that to me was the disappointing part. That said, you know, it's like, how do you balance that? Because I like it, I just wish it was actually an M2. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.